Hi everybody, Tata Steel is one of the greatest companies in the history of India. And the most astonishing thing about this company is that it has been a major pillar of India's economy for more than 114 years. And these 114 years include the most turbulent times in world history, including two world wars, the Great Depression and four national wars. But all throughout these times, Tata Steel has stood tall and managed to become a dominating force in the world steel industry. The question is, how did Tata Steel become such a formidable company? How did it manage to remain powerful even during the British Raj? And most importantly, what are the lessons that we need to learn from the incredible house of the Tatas? This is a story that dates back to 1880s India, when Jamshedji Tata was travelling around the world to understand the different advancements in the textile industry. During this time, he attended a lecture by a British historian and philosopher by the name Thomas Carlyle. And in this lecture, Thomas Carlyle stated that a nation that understood the value of iron would reap its weight in gold. And Jamshedji was so inspired by his lecture that for the next 30 years until his death, Jamshedji worked tirelessly to establish the iron and steel plant in India. The question is, why did Thomas Carlyle say that and what was the underlying meaning of his statement? Well, as it turns out, the 1860s was the most important decade of the 19th century. During this time, although railways was a revolutionary invention, its cost of operation and expansion was very, very high. This was mainly because cast iron that was being used to lay the tracks was extremely costly, they could not carry a lot of load and they also needed a lot of maintenance. This was because cast iron was susceptible to rust. Meanwhile, steel production was even more costly because of which steel was only used in small quantities in tools like swords and cutlery. But in the historic year of 1856, a British engineer named Henry Besmeyer invented a cost-effective and mass-producible technique to make steel. And this process was such a breakthrough that during that time, it reduced the cost of steel production by 82%, from 40 pounds to just 6 to 7 pounds per long ton. And this invention, ladies and gentlemen, alone catalyzed the entire industrial revolution in the Western world. And in the next 10 years, steel became a general purpose material and was being used in every important aspect of development, starting from construction all the way up to the railways. And steel was not just revolutionary because of its cheap production, but also because when it was used in railways, it could withstand way more loads as compared to iron. And more importantly, the maintenance of railways became extremely cheap. Therefore, steel became the most fundamental pillar of Western nation's development. This is the reason why Thomas Carlyle said, a nation that understood the value of iron would reap its weight in gold. And as soon as Jamshedji understood this, he spent the rest of his life in the pursuit of building an iron and steel plant for India. During this time, Jamshedji Tata had established the iconic Empress Mill in Nagpur. And like we saw in the previous Tata episode, within a very short span of time, it had become a pioneer and a market leader in the textile industry. But in spite of having all the wealth in the world, Jamshedji Tata was more keen on building a solid economic foundation for India than building his own fortune. So as soon as he came to India, he started reading every single report published by every renowned geologist so that he could find iron ore deposits in India. And the craziest thing about this legend is that Jamshedji and his team spent not 5, not 10, but the next 17 years in finding and collecting samples for iron ores. At the same time, he was also managing and growing his textile business. And as the great saying goes, fortune always favours the bold and persistent. Finally, after 17 years of exploration, in 1899, in the small village of Sakchi, Jamshedji Tata's geologist Perrin ended up finding 3 billion tons of ore. And the best part was that, this ore was located just 45 miles away from the railway station. And this is how, ladies and gentlemen, India embarked on its journey to participate in the steel revolution of the world. But unfortunately, Jamshedji wasn't alive to see his dream come true. While he passed away in 1904, his son Dhurabji Tata and brother Aldi Tata took his dream forward and finally, the Tata Steel Limited was incorporated in the year 1907 with the name Tata Iron and Steel Company Limited. And after five long years of preparation and fundraising, in 1912, the first steel ingot rolled out of the factory. Now the question over here is, all of this was happening when India was under the British Raj, right? Then the question is, 
Why and how did the British government allow these Indian enterprises to grow? Well, there were three reasons for that. Number one, the Britishers realized that the real profit was not in making steel, but in making railways so that they could make money with trade expansion. So the construction of the railways was more important than the steel plant. Secondly, they realized that importing steel all the way from Britain or the neighboring colonies was extremely costly and an extremely tedious procedure. And obviously, surveying the entire subcontinent was also not a viable option. Therefore, they liberalized the mining laws so that people like Jamshidji could use their resources and provide steel for the government. And lastly, on 28th of July 1914, World War One broke out. And this turned the British Empire's attitude towards Indian enterprises from jealousy to positive encouragement. Now over here, some people often ask me as to why the Tatas helped the Britishers? Couldn't they just let the Britishers lose the war? Well, it's not as simple as that guys. Because had they done that, the British Empire would have easily taken over the plant forcefully. Which means what? 3 billion tons of ore would belong to the Britishers. And on top of that, they would have banned the Tatas from building the other industries. One of which was Tata Power, which even to this day is one of India's most valuable assets. So while most of us think of industries as just money-making machines, it is important for us to note that empires might rise and fall, wars might come and go. But if a nation strategically invests into industries, these industries will act as the most important engines of a nation's economy and they will last for centuries. In this case, if you look carefully, even during the British Raj, Jamshiji Tata laid the foundations of three of the most important industries in India, that is textile, steel and power. And the absence of these industries would have left India in ruins during the post-independence period. A classic example of the same is the state of Singapore in 1965. This is the reason why the Tatas supported the Britishers. In that period, Tisco became the only supplier of steel in India and it enjoyed a terrific boom. And Tata Steel alone supplied 1500 miles of rail and 300,000 tons of steel material. And this created thousands of jobs for the Indian workers and established Tata Company as an unshakable entity in the Indian business ecosystem. And just when everyone thought that Tisco was all set for the high, the World War bubble burst and in 1920, the world witnessed something called the post-war recession. And suddenly, there was no longer a soaring demand for steel and no more jobs for the soldiers. In fact, in America alone, the number of active soldiers fell from 29 lakhs to just 3.8 lakhs within just two years in 1920. And India was no different either. As the war wrapped up, the Indian industries got badly affected and Tata Steel's only regular customer, Japan, was shaken up by an earthquake which again killed the demand for steel. The condition was so bad that SBI, which was back then known as the Imperial Bank of India, they refused to extend loans to the Tatas. And to make matters worse, on 29th of October 1929, the New York Stock Exchange collapsed, which pushed the world into one of the worst economic crises in world history. This was nothing but the period of Great Depression, which lasted for 10 years from 1928 to 1938. Now during such a time, the industrialists followed a very simple procedure. They immediately fired all of their employees because they already made a ton of money during the war. And all they needed to do was fire all the workers or sell the company to somebody else and just enjoy the massive wealth that they had built for the rest of their life. This is the reason why, if you look at the timeline of the world from 1920 to 1939, every single major industry in the world, starting from America to the British colonies, all of them witnessed major labor strikes. But amidst all of this chaos, you know what's the most surprising fact of all? While every other industry in the world saw dozens of labor strikes throughout the Great Depression, the Tatas did not see a single labor strike throughout the Great Depression after 1929. The question is, what was so special about the Tatas that they did not witness a single labor strike even during the worst economic crisis in world history? Well, that is because the Tatas were no ordinary industrialists. In this case, Dorabji also had the same option of letting the workers go to enjoy his fortunes. But this is where the Tatas stood out. The Tatas never saw their ventures as just money-making machines. They saw them as engines of India's economy that would stand as pillars of India's development. So in spite of having 55,000 workers, Dorabji and RD Tata 
did everything in their capacity to not fire a single worker and Dhorab ji even put his personal assets for sale and asked his wife to pawn her jewels. This way, the Tatas did everything in their capacity to pay every single worker on time in spite of the terrible market conditions. On top of that, to make workers feel secure, they introduced several schemes for the workers' family which included free medical aid, the retirement graduate scheme and even the maternity benefit scheme. It was even decided a few years later that the families of contract workers who suffered accidents at the Tata Steel premises would be provided cover and benefits through a scheme called the Suraksha scheme. All of this was being done in spite of the company bleeding money that was coming from the personal assets of Dhorabji Tata. This was the true spirit of the Tatas because of which they have not seen a single labor strike for 100 years now. Such was the legacy of the second generation of the House of Tatas until another legend by the name J.R.D. Tata took over the company in 1938. We'll talk about him in the upcoming episodes but for now, with all this information that we have, let's move on to the most important part of the episode and that is, as future leaders, what are the business lessons that we need to learn from the incredible House of the Tatas and what are the study materials to help you dive deeper? Meanwhile, if you're someone who loves the Tatas as much as we do, you can use the small case app to invest into the best Tata companies by opting in for the House of Tata small case. Small case is this wonderful company that designs a basket of stocks to help you make the best investments in any market conditions. In this case, the House of Tata small case contains hand-picked stocks from the Tata conglomerate that have got extremely high growth potential. And the best part is that the small case manager will automatically rebalance the stocks as per the market conditions to give you the best returns possible. And even if you do not want to make investments, you could use my favorite feature in this app that is the news section and the newsletters. These are again wonderful pieces of contents that will help you get the latest updates about the most important happenings in the market. So if you love their idea, download the small case app from the link in the description. Moving on to the lessons from the case study, there are three very very important lessons that we need to learn from the house of Tatas. Lesson number one, no matter how big or small of an entrepreneur you are, if you want to be the best in your sector, you have to be a voracious reader and an ardent student of your industry. In this case, if you see, at 40 years old, most people often give up on learning. But here we saw Jamsheji Tata, at the age of 40, he was still attending lectures in spite of being a successful industrialist. This is the reason why he was able to understand the importance of steel and eventually that information gave our country a billion dollar asset like Tisco. Lesson number two, capitalism is the most powerful weapon of growth for any nation. And like I said, empires might rise and fall, wars might come and go, but if a nation strategically invests into industries, they will act as the most important engines of the nation's economy. In this case, it was Jamshedji's foresight to lay the foundations for India in spite of the British Raj. And the strategic investments made by the House of Tatas in textile, steel and power helped India get back on her feet even after the Britishers left. And last and most importantly, while good businessmen grow their business to build their fortunes, great businessmen like Jamshedji Tata and Dhorabji Tata grow their business as a service to their nation and more importantly, as a service to mankind itself. That's all from my side for today guys. If you learned something valuable, please make sure to hit the like button and all to make YouTube Baba happy. And for more such insightful business and political case studies, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next one. Bye bye.